So what I'll do is I'll go in and take questions now. Anybody else have any queries? Anjali, uh, you have put your hand up. Please go ahead. Sir, what is endosome in the first slide that you showed? Uh, so endosomes are essentially vesicles that are pinched off. Uh, that could come from the plasma membrane. There could be, uh, you know, uh, they, they are brought in through endocytosis. Um, and uh, these now will carry, uh, you know, not just what's on the membrane, they will carry receptors. Um, and the endosomes can get targeted to, to very specific locations inside the cell. The endosomes also have receptors which are bound to ligands. Uh, and so as they are brought in, they can be used for many different purposes. You know, they can be used to, to affect the, the architecture of the lipid membrane as they keep, you know, going in. They could also be, um, you know, used to regulate signaling. They could uh, be used to regulate the availability of receptors on the plasma membrane. All things that, uh, you know, uh, that the endosomes are able to do. We didn't talk extensively about the process of endocytosis uh, in this. There are different mechanisms of endocytosis as well. Um, and, you know, when you come to the advanced cell biology course, we will be talking about, uh, you know, clatherin-mediated endocytosis, caviolar endocytosis, uh, and such. Hmm? Uh, Kishan, you have your hand up. Sir, you were talking about how uh, the stiffness of a cell can affect the gene regulation. Mm -hmm. So, if if the cell shape uh, was uh, able to uh, was manipulated from the outside, mm -hmm. would that mean that we could change how the genes regulate? Yeah. So you know, if you take cells like the endothelial cells that line our blood vessel. Okay, and people have done these experiments where they put them on um, dishes, right, on, on, on slides. Um, and um, all you do now is you grow them normally and then they form a nice sheet of cells, right? And, and then you put them in a chamber where you can flow liquid at the rate at which uh, it flows in your blood vessels, okay? Just having that flow of liquid um, okay, above the cells, right? So the liquid is flowing over the cells, um, changes the orientation of the cells. So the cells are, you know, kind of pointing in all directions. The moment flow starts in this direction, in a couple of hours, all the cells orient in this direction. They're all now pointing this way, okay, in, in the direction of flow. You change the direction of flow to this. It will take a couple of hours, but they will all orient in this direction. Okay, um, and the the moment you you apply flow, signaling, gene expression, everything in the cell changes. Okay, so the mechano responsiveness of cells is is truly, uh, you know, one of the um, black boxes really that we are just beginning to understand. Right, there is, but but it's it's very very vital to everything that the cells do in our body. Right? They don't do this without the context of a mechanical cue. I mean, we, may, we may notice it very obviously sometimes, we may not, but what we are discovering is more and more uh, it is the case that the mechanical uh, milieu, the mechanical uh, you know, uh, kind of cues that the cell is getting uh, is very vital to what the cell, uh, how the cell behaves in your body. Mm -hmm. um, Kishan, Kishan, I took your query, right? Uh, Vignesh. Uh, yes, sir. I was thinking about how uh, nuclei eventually evolved because uh, I, uh, when we look at the endosymbiotic theory regarding mitochondria and chloroplasts, mm -hmm. we said that uh, bacteria get engulfed, like uh, archaea engulfed bacteria, and then that formed mitochondria. So I, I, I read a bit about this, and then there seems to be a, a sort of similar theory about the nucleus itself. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking about when uh, when initially this sort of endosymbiosis happened and a cell needs to undergo cell division. Mm -hmm. And during that time, you might not have these centrioles that, uh, that open up the nuclear membrane and then allow, uh, that allow those yes. Uh, yes. mitosis uh, phases to occur. So like during those times, would it be possible to think that maybe the nucleus itself divided usually as a bacteria does and then it, it could be it could be so it's possible that there existed cells where or there existed a bag of lipid in which there were multiple quote-unquote nuclei 
right? Uh, because essentially it was this uh, original cell uh, that had been taken in and now is essentially dividing. Um, and it may have taken a while for, um, uh, you know, the, the particularly, for example, the genetic content of the nucleus um, driving the control of the rest of the cell is again an another huge step in terms of, you know, not just having something inside uh, another cell, but now it having a significant say in what happens. So, so that's how it could have begun. Uh, you know, it's highly possible. We don't know for sure, but you but know, the speculation. You also have the parent DNA and the host DNA. That aren't they like sort of competing with each other now? And what that's, happens that's, to the you're, uh, you're assuming that uh, there was a parent DNA. Doesn't have to be, no? Um, what if this was just the DNA that came in? We don't know, right? We don't know. Right, okay. So it could be just a bag of lipid that took up something, um, which then became the, the master of the that entire bag, right? And it kind of took over um, and now eventually uh, drives everything that, uh, you know, that, that made the modern cell as we know it, right? Yeah, but it's a, it, it's a fascinating area and, and there are a lot of questions that remain to be answered, okay? Okay, uh, Anandita. Uh, yes, sir. I wanted to know if euchromatin and heterochromatin are also part of the chromosomal characteristics. Is that the yes, yes, yes. So, so obviously, there, um, you know, the U and heterochromatin are um, um, are where the DNA is wrapped. You know, is is present, right? So, when you talk about chromosome territories, uh, you know, it's essentially these structures that are kept in place. And they're kept in place. So, as I said, you know, you should go look up some of the work that Kundan's lab is doing because they do very interesting stuff where they are trying to figure out what exactly is in this group of genes or this DNA that is present here that allows it to be anchored to this particular site. Right? Okay. Because, because where it is located, if it's, for example, uh, if and, and, and these chromosome territories move around, by the way, huh? So they can be moved around in the cell, it's in the nucleus itself, depending upon what group of genes you want to express how, right? So, so go look this up. There is a lot of information on how chromosome territories are held, where they are, and how this influences gene expression. And also, sir, do nuclear pores form and dissociate as and when needed, or is it that they're already formed and they're rigid there? No, no, though they form and dissociate. They form and dissociate. Um, I'm, I'm trying to think whether there is um, a significant amount of the nuclear pore complex that breaks up in um, a, a, a nucleus, um, you know, regularly. Um, and I'm inclined to say that happens. But let me also look this up. I, I'm not sure how much of a turnaround happens. But my sense is it does. When cell division obviously happens, uh, there is a, the turnaround increases pretty dramatically. Right? Um, Srijani, your query. So, uh, so since uh, physical stress can also, mechanical stress can change a gene regulation and it can probably even cause division. So, um, does the cell have uh, some sort of protective mechanism to uh, prevent that? Because otherwise all physical injuries or, uh, you know, even small changes could cause uh, changes. Right. So, so I'm not sure this all cells want to actually not respond to mechanical cues, right? See, mechanical cues will obviously change, um, you know, expression of genes will affect the behavior of cells. Um, are cells trying to say, uh, you know, let me not be mechanoresponsive? Maybe there is, there are certain situations where they don't want to be mechanoresponsive and they may have mechanisms that will prevent mechanoresponsiveness at that time. But cells in general, you know, to large or small extents, like for example, endothelial cells respond to flow in a way that maybe kidney cells don't, right? And, and the extent of that uh, responsiveness may vary, but um, it does look like most cells have um, the ability to react to mechanical cues, right? And, and they have been doing this all along in ways that we have just not noticed, 
right? So, um, for example, tissues have a certain stiffness, and because tissues have certain stiffnesses, the cells, you know, it's a it's a kind of a circular me mechanism or a circular uh, thing where the cells help create the environment uh, that um, uh, create the environment that um, drives the stiffness because the extracellular matrix that is secreted is secreted by cells. Um, and, and now that environment comes back and uh, tells the cell how to feel because of, a, of the stiffness that is present in that environment. So there is a feedback loop here, right? And that constitutes uh, part of the normal homeostasis of the cell, right? So for example, in diseases like cancer, this uh, environment and its stiffness does change significantly. Right. And, and that, um, um, you know, is thought to contribute to how the cells behave and what they are now capable of doing. So uh, to kind of answer your query, is there a mechanism by which the cell switches off its mechano responsiveness at a certain time? Um, I, I'm not sure whether it exists in the form that you are asking. Right. But it could possibly ha be happening for specific pathways per se. Right. That. Um, that that responsiveness could be changed. We're was, almost, yeah. I was actually thinking in terms of uh, how there are some diseases which get triggered after uh, physical injuries. So would they have a so is there is that? there a disease that is triggered after physical injury? Yes. Uh, uh, I know of one, uh, there's a pain, uh, a chronic pain condition. No, no. A chronic pain condition is because of nerves being affected right but uh, i've also heard as so i was reading up on this and i've also read that they do have a genetic factor to them so i was wondering if no so see that's what i'm saying so those are actually you know pain is a completely different mechanism altogether right and and you cannot um uh, associate a physical injury that happens for example you fall down you get hurt your screen gets scratched that is injury obviously there are there is a mechanical damage that has taken place but that's not driving the behavior of the cell everything that happens as a result of the injury now the cell is uh, reacting to right and and that's what drives either recovery um, or you know not thereof you know or lack of recovery as the case may be